Good morning and welcome to the Norfolk Society of Arts second lecture of the 2020-2021 lecture series. My name is Jan Bradley and it's my pleasure to serve as president of NSA. As I once again welcome you from the Kaufman Theater at the Chrysler Museum, I hope that you are safe and doing well during this difficult time. Most of you are now aware that all of our fall lectures will be virtual with a live question and answer. I hope you all received your membership invitation in early September and once again decided to support Norfolk Society of Arts. If you did not receive an invitation and would like to join, please go to our website at www.norfolksocietyofarts.org. Please remember your membership dues enable us to bring you the world-class speakers you have enjoyed over the years, and we thank you for your support. Our speaker today, Melissa Kahn, is Director of Venice Office, Save Venice Incorporated, an American nonprofit organization dedicated to raising funds for the conservation of art and architecture in Venice, Italy. Ms. Kahn has over 30 years experience in the field of Venetian art history and conservation. She was born and raised in Ohio and received a degree in art history from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I would like to read you a quote from Kat Bauer, the author of The Venetian Cat, The Venetian Blog. St. Mark Enthroned was restored thanks to a contribution of David and Ellen Rosen in honor of Melissa Kahn, with an anonymous contribution in or honor of David Rosen. David Rosen was a revered art historian who died in August of 2014, as well as a project director of Save Venice Incorporated, an American organization that restores precious works here in Venice. Rosen's specialty was 16th century Venetian art, Titian in particular. That David and Ellen Rosen have honored Melissa Kahn with the restoration of a Titian in her name illustrates the high esteem in which she is held, not only within the organization, but within the city of Venice. Melissa herself selected the painting that would be restored, which she said was a tremendous responsibility. The powerful St. Mark enthroned was a wise choice, a compelling votive painting inside a formidable votive church. With such illustrious saints watching St. Mark's back, the freshly restored painting should hold the Lord's attention for another thousand years. Now from Venice, Italy, please welcome Melissa Kahn. Hello. I'd like to thank the Norfolk Society of Arts for asking me to speak to you today about the art and science of saving Venice. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Virginia, but I'm happy to bring a little bit of Venice to you. I'm speaking from the Save Venice office in Palazzo Contarini Polignac, uh, near the Academian Bridge on the Grand Canal. Save Venice is an American organization that raises funds in the United States for the restoration of art and architecture in Venice. We were founded after the floods of 1966 that brought the world's attention to the fragile nature of the artistic patrimony of Venice. Um, since then, we've restored thousands and thousands of works of art and been um, committed to our mission to also expand the knowledge of Venetian history, culture, as well as art. Venice is located in Northeast Italy. It's a cluster of islands in the Venetian Lagoon, today with a population of about 55,000 people. But it wasn't always that way. Venice, was the motherland of a vast um, territory, a vast empire that stretched throughout the Adriatic Sea into even the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea. And Venice considered herself the queen of the Mediterranean. Uh, she was a republic uh, based on um, uh, a society of, of merchants. There were many, many concepts that started in Venice. One in particular is the quarantine. Venice in 1468 uh, started to use the terminology quarantena, meaning about 40 days, 
which was the amount of time that ships had to stay outside of Venice proper and stay in the Venetian Lagoon before they would be allowed to unload their merchandise in the city. And this was a way to keep disease away. Venice also was ahead of her time for starting isolation areas. Venice had the island of San Lazaretto established in 1423, where um, victims of the plague or anyone that was ill was, were kept separated from the rest of the population. Uh, another very important Venetian concept in our day to day is the ballot. The word ballot comes from Venetian balotte because the Venetians used a small little ball, a white ball or a black ball, to vote for their elected officials. And because Venice was really the only republic that was known in the, the 18th century when France and the United States were creating their system of voting, the term ballote or ballot uh, was transferred into the use also in English. Venice was very important still in the late 18th century. And uh, this is certainly underlined by a letter that was written to the Venetian Republic by the founding fathers of the United States because they wanted to have an agreement of friendship and commerce with the Venetian Republic. Unfortunately, uh, this never came to be. The Venetians didn't answer actually their initial request because they didn't want to offend England, but it didn't matter because in 1797, uh, the Venetian Republic finally did fall as Napoleon took over Europe. And Napoleon uh, had Venice uh, for a period of time and then he gave it back to the Austrians and then gave it back to, to France. And so it was a quite a period of turmoil in Italy and Venice in particular in the 19th century. And so during the 19th century is certainly when the decline of Venice begin, begins. And this is when a lot of Venice's artworks ended up being sold or going abroad. Of course, this is a way of conserving the artworks and it is uh, nice to know that there's such an impressive collection of Venetian art in the Chrysler Museum and certainly well protected and taken care of. Uh, in the 19th century, there were also a lot of uh, American view painters who came to Venice. And in particular, uh, Thomas Moran was here along with Sargent and Whistler. And this painting, that in the Chrysler Museum by Moran uh, shows Venice uh, a view of his memory of Venice because it's painted in 1898. His last trip was in 1890, but he continued to paint these Venice scenes, remembering the time he had spent there with his family. And Moran also brought back a very unusual souvenir from his time in Venice, the Moran gondola, uh, which is now in the Maritime Museum in Newport News. And this is the oldest known gondola in the world. Uh, Moran took it back with him and he had used it while he was in Venice and decided that it would be a nice thing to have uh, on Long Island in his home. So that's where the gondola was for many years until it was donated in uh, 1926 to the Maritime Museum. Say so Venice restored a gondola recently, not quite as old, an early tw uh, 20th century gondola, but certainly this shows the importance of boats and water in Venice, because Venice being in a lagoon, surrounded by water, certainly uh, depends heavily on water for transportation, for protection, the water can also be a problem. We often hear about flooding in Venice. Uh, this happens in any city along the coast. Uh, tidal flooding is known, as you know, in Norfolk, also, also in Venice, where it seems to make a lot of, of news. Uh, in Venice, typically, typically, with the small flooding, you just need to decide what level of boots to put on. You can wear low rubber boots, high level rubber boots. And we even have maps that tell you uh, where, where you can walk in the city, depending on uh, what type of foot gear you have on. But of course, the flooding is a serious issue. And the biggest flood, second biggest flood in the history of Venice happened in November of 2019. Uh, the city was struck uh, by a tide with great winds, um, which flooded the city in the evening and then continued on and off for about six weeks afterwards. So of course this flood was uh, certainly another catalyst for say Venice. I've spent a lot of time lecturing about the 1966 floods and talking about uh, why saving artistic patrimony and why the floodwaters were a problem. 
and that now during the time when I'm responsible for say Venice in Venice to be facing uh, another issue like this was really an amazing experience. So Venice moved very quickly and we were able to establish the immediate response fund. And this um, fund was aided with support from the Italian embassy in Washington who launched the America Loves Venice campaign with the funding going to Save Venice. And so we were able to raise about $700,000 from private donations and immediately work on assisting 22 restoration sites uh, for flood damage, prevention of future damage. And we're still working with this fund today uh, with prevention measures and, and um, correcting any of the damage and trying to prevent something like this happening in the future. But of course, the big project, the flood barrier project is funded by the national government. St. So Venice concentrates on the restoration of art and architecture, whereas this enormous public works project that the Italian government started about 25 or 30 years ago is now in place. And in the beginning of October, 2020, we had a successful raising of the flood barrier and protected the city from another expected high tide. So we're very positive that in the future, the city will now be protected from uh, the extreme tidal flooding. But of course, there still will be the um, typical high tide that will cause flooding in the low, lower areas of the city. Of course, it's important to save the city from the flooding, but we also have to save and take care of its artistic patrimony. Venice is a very difficult climate. We're in the middle of a very, uh, and a marsh, a very salty atmosphere. And it's the salt that evaporates in the air that is, um, builds up on the artworks. And salt is very corrosive and it eats into marble, into paint. There's also a lot of humidity in Venice. We have the capillary rise of humidity in the brickwork here. And so it's a constant upkeep and maintenance that is important because these artworks were made to be in Venice. They have adapted rather successfully, but it takes a lot of, of care and attention to make sure that the artworks can remain in their original location in Venice. Traveling uh, is difficult for Venetian artworks because they get accustomed to being in a, a non-air conditioned, non-heated area in a church in Venice. But recently in 2019, uh, there was a, a major exhibition of Venetian painting in the National Gallery in Washington. And so Venice helped to contribute to this exhibition by restoring a number of paintings so that they were safe to travel and be viewed by the public in Washington. There's a painting from the Chrysler Museum that also went to the exhibition. This is Jacopo Tintoretto's painting of spring, painted in Venice in 1546, 1548. Now this painting came from Ca Barbo. It's a, it was a palace, a building by, owned by the Barbo family uh, near San Pantalone in the Dorso Doro district of Venice. It was part of a series of, of paintings of the Four Seasons. Today, that area of Venice is better known by a mural on the building next door to Ca Barbo by the contemporary graffiti artist Banksy. What's interesting about the Vansky mural is it isn't meant to last the way spring, uh, the Tintoretto painting was is still protected today. The Vansky mural is bound to deteriorate because it's painted directly on the plaster that goes, is covered by the tides uh, twice a day. Of course, conserving paintings um, is a major part of say Venice's mission and paintings that undergo conservation treatment just like the painting of spring, um, often lead to new discoveries, a new understanding of an artwork. Here we have a painting from the Church of San Marziale in Venice that was restored for this Washington exhibition. It's a painting that had been overlooked for years and years because of its condition. You can see the very dark varnish due to the fact that during a conservation campaign in 1949, 1950, uh, the painting was covered with a tinted varnish to give it sort of a Venetian golden glow. This was a good way of masking damage and uh, evening out the color tone, but it wasn't really what the painting was supposed to look like. 
And then through the years, obviously this varnish starts to discolor and change. So the treatment of the St. Marshall in glory from the Church of San Marziale was sort of a tremendous before and after. If you see the painting after conservation, no longer having the yellow glow when the true whites of the robes and the clouds are much more evident. I'm sort of bringing this painting back into the limelight and in fact being featured in a special segment of the exhibition in Washington last spring. Of course, during restoration, you can see as we start to take off this varnish uh, slowly and gradually uh, when the true white tones start to emerge. Now, one thing we learned during the conservation is something about the pigments that Tintoretto used. He used a pigment called orpiment, which is not very stable and in fact was a very, very bright yellow. So here you have the robe of St. Peter that now looks a, kind of a funny brown, would have been a very, very lovely shade of yellowish gold. We also learned that the figure of St. Paul in the painting, again in an odd brown robe, was actually painted with a copper resin pigment that would have been very, very green. So we just have to keep in mind all the time with these Venetian paintings is that we're not really seeing them in the exact same color tone. And during conservation, you certainly wouldn't repaint something, even though if you know the color it used to be, because the idea is to preserve and not change. It is interesting to compare the spring painting with the, the San Marziale painting from Venice, because painted at the same time period, it's true that Jacopo Tintoretto used to use um, outlines that he would share from various paintings. And these figures of the legs of the spring painting are very similar to the, the legs of the male saints that you see in our Venetian painting as well. Now, another painting very important to Venetian art in the Chrysler Museum is Paolo Veronese's Virgin and Child appearing with Saints Anthony Abbott and Paul. Uh, this is a painting that's uh, of great interest also to say Venice, and I'll explain why. The painting was painted in Venice by the artist Paolo Veronese, but it wasn't destined for a Venetian church. It was instead made for the Church of San Benedetto Paul, which is near Mantova in Italy. So this was commissioned from Veronese while he lived in Venice. And he did this, these three paintings uh, in three months, which is an incredible fast time. But we know this from the document of the commission and the payment. Now, those paintings were painted for three chapels in the church of San Benedetto Paul. Uh, one painting is now in the National Gallery and the second painting at the Chrysler Museum. The third painting ended up in London and was destroyed in a fire in the 19th century. But the other three paint, the other two paintings still survive and are an ex interesting example when you compare them to um, works that we have in the Church of San Sebastiano in Venice, painted at the same time. Say Venice has been working on the Church of San Sebastiano and the artworks by Paolo Veronese uh, for the past, uh, let's see, <laughs> about the past 12 years. Um, in San Sebastiano, we have uh, remnants of frescoes that Veronese painted that have Saints Anthony Abbott and Paul, similar to the painting uh, in the Chrysler Museum. Now our frescoes were done at the same time as the painting. And a little bit earlier, just a year before, Veronese painted the high altar for the Church of San Sebastiano. And here you can see the similarities that he'd already done this painting for San Sebastiano when he had the commission for the San Benedetto Paul painting. And you see the figure of the Virgin and Child uh, with the angels being very, very similar in both works. Now I can talk about the restoration of our Madonna and Child uh, with saints. And you can see what we learned about it and what uh, brought to a better understanding of how Veronese works. Here you can see the painting being taken down off the high altar. We moved it into a chapel uh, next to the high altar for conservation because it's best to keep the paintings uh, as in as close to the original location so that you don't change their, their microclimate. So this painting, the first thing we had to do was remove the dirt and surface grime and start removing the discolored varnish. And here you can see right away uh, the, the lighter color, color tones come out when the, uh, the yellowed varnish is removed. Varnish is important, it protects the painting. But unfortunately, it tends to be photosensitive and it changes color with time. 
they also restored the altar, the stone altar around the painting, which was uh, nearly completely black, as you see from the photograph, uh, due to the accumulation of, um, of smoke and even coal that was in the atmosphere from, from coal heating in uh, the earlier 20th century. We also did scientific studies on our painting of uh, Saint, of Saint Sebastian with the Madonna and Child in Glory to understand some of the odder areas of the painting, particularly the black clouds, which um, it wasn't it seemed a bit ominous and not really what Veronese intended. And so we were able to take pigment samples, look at them under a microscope, and determine that Veronese used a pigment called blue smalt. It's, it was a beautiful, beautiful blue color. But unfortunately, it was fugitive, not stable, and would lose its color with time. And mixed with oils, kind of developed an orangish brown color. And so that's why the painting um, has the darker clouds and some of the darker blues. Other areas of the painting, Veronese used um, better pigments, pigments that are more stable, like azurite and lapis. And so that's why we haven't lost all the blues in this painting. But here you can see it after conservation. We continue to work in San Sebastiano on other large works by Veronese. These are two paintings on canvas in the presbytery. Uh, similar issues with a very, very dark sky. And then once again, we assume that the blue smalt pigment had been, had been implemented. Uh, smalt was made um, from cobalt and potassium, and it was quite common in Venice because it was an offshoot of the glass production and glass coming from the island of Murano. And so it was a pigment that was less expensive than the other pigments. And that's why Veronese would have used it for skies and larger backgrounds. So we did our chemical analysis and it did find the blue smalt, uh, this time directly uh, on the canvas. And so there was really nothing we could do. It wasn't mixed with any other pigments. So the painting had been restored. A lovely, lovely scene, seen in the life of St. Sebastian with the brilliant fabrics and colors, but the sky unfortunately remains permanently damaged. Another painting right across from this is the martyrdom of St. Sebastian, again, with a very, very dark sky. After conservation, certainly the appearance is improved, but there's nothing we can do about the small deterioration. Working in San Sebastiano has been uh, one of the great moments in, say, Venice's uh, career, let's say. We restored the ceiling, the walls, the frescoes, panel paintings, canvases, painted canvases, and really had a greater understanding of how Paolo Veronese and his workshop um, undertook this great endeavor in about a 15 year period that Veronese worked there. We worked on the ceiling of the church, first of all, starting in 2009, a wooden ceiling that had been overpainted in dark colors, but was supposed to look as if it were marble. We also restored ceiling canvases telling the story of Esther. The Esther canvas is where we first started to realize the problems with smalt. In this situation, the skies had been repainted in the 19th century. And so in this photograph, you can see the painting uh, with the three different levels of sky, removing the overpainting, showing the smalt deterioration, and then down to a sort of a gray sky, a Venice in the winter sky. Uh, because of the smalt being mixed with a white lead pigment, which led to this gray color. Of course, the Veronese paintings, the rest of them have beautiful colors. Uh, it's been a remarkable sort of rediscovery of the work of Paolo Veronese in the church of San Sebastiano. The Esther painting after completion uh, had to be lifted by pulleys up to the ceiling of the church. Uh, had a last viewing by uh, some local nuns and then taken back to stay, we hope, for a considerable amount of time on the ceiling of the church. So Venice continued with the frescoes all around the walls of the church because Veronese painted these in 1557-1558. This is a scene of the archers, the archers in the first attempt of martyrdom of San Sebastiano, he's sentenced to death in the fourth century and archers uh, shoot him with arrows he doesn't die from this. He then late, later has a second martyrdom. But this fresco shows the archers shooting arrows across the nave of the church to a figure of St. Sebastian on the other side. Here we have a blue background, which also had smalt. Uh, but this has retained its blue color because when smalt is mixed with water in a fresco, 
um, it doesn't have the same alteration process and also depends on the mix of potassium and cobalt. So this is one of the rare examples of smalt that still exists and some blue in the church. Veronese finished the, the frescoes on all the walls of the church in 1559. And then the church um, had funding to build an organ and an organ loft. So Veronese designed a wooden organ loft and painted the, the paintings um, for the organ shutters. As you can see, this covers frescoes. And in fact, Veronese had to cover frescoes he had himself painted just six months before. While we restored the organ loft and had taken down the organ and the pipes of the organ, we were able to see these frescoes that Veronese himself had covered over by the organ loft. And so we did studies on the frescoes, but decided not to intervene, to not touch them in any way, because this is a rare example of an artwork by Paolo Veronese that's never undergone conservation treatment. So they've been photographed and again, um, analyzed, but then the organ, the church's latest organ was put back up and they've been covered by the organ pipes. We continue working in the Church of San Sebastiano to also protect the exterior because of the frescoes, particularly on the interior wall. It's important that the walls, exterior walls are very dry and safe. This was a major project to restore the facade and the side facades. What we're working on right now is our monks stalls. This is in the elevated monks loft. And another unusual discovery is that the monks loft were painted. The stalls were actually painted in uh, designs that Veronese had given to the church. This was confirmed by a document that was found stating a payment record for these designs that were donated to the church. And so this was a, a wonderful new discovery because this had all been overpainted by heavy brown paint in the 19th century. And so we're constantly having new discoveries and understandings. Of course, the Church of San Sebastiano also was damaged in the November flood. And St. Venice's immediate response fund worked very quickly there to rinse off the floors, the salts. We're working actually uh, in the fall of 2020 on a watertight sub subfloor for the bell tower behind the church because this is where the water seeps in. Changing gears a bit, we can move out to the island of Torcello, which is another big project that St. Venice is working on now. Of course, Torcello was founded, um, the building you see was founded in the seventh century. This is the oldest monument in the Venetian lagoon. Torcello is about a 40 minute boat ride from Venice. It was, it's always been very popular with Americans particularly Ernest Hemingway, who spent the month of November of 1948 on the island, writing his Venetian novel across the river and into the trees. He said that he would write half the day and then duck hunt the rest of the afternoon. Working on Torcello uh, reminds one of what Venice used to be um, in the fact that the, the development of, of Venice in an in, in island in the lagoon. Venice, uh, Torcello, uh, was a thriving community, and now all that's left are um, a handful of houses and two churches, when there were once um, almost a dozen monasteries and convents on the island in a thriving community. Um, Torcello slowly dies out because of malaria. It wasn't um, a very healthy place to live, and Venice itself starts to develop more and more in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century. And so Venice becomes the major center of the lagoon and Torcello uh, is destined to a slow decline. Uh, nowadays, there are eight people that live on the island of Torcello, but the monuments there are very important. So Venice first started working on Torcello. In uh, 1977, we joined a group of international committees uh, to restore the mosaics as Torcello is very well known for its Byzantine mosaics. St. Venice returned to Torcello uh, when we decided we wanted a really important um, project to celebrate our 50th anniversary. St. Venice was incorporated in 1971. And so next year in 2021, we'll be celebrating 50, 50 years of activity. And so we decided to adapt to adopt two apses of the church, the central apse and the diaconicon apse, and the respective mosaics. 
But restoring the mosaics also means restoring the wall behind the mosaics. And here you can see the decaying brick and the crumbling mortar. The walls of Torcello um, have bricks, Roman bricks, Roman um, bricks that were recycled by the Venetians during their first uh, building campaign on Torcello in the seventh century, because there was a Roman settlement on the Venetian mainland. There are also bricks from the seventh century, from the ninth, from the 11th, all through the ages. And so there's a tremendous amount of work now that say Venice has undertaken to restore these bricks, try not to replace them, but only if necessary, uh, insert them with um, replacement pieces. Bricks are important because they support the mosaics. And here you can see uh, in a little model that I keep on my desk of, uh, of how a mosaic is put on a wall. You have the brick core, the rough coat of plaster, then a supporting plaster, and then the mosaic pieces. So the brickwork has to be very, very secure, as do the layers of plaster, for a mosaic to survive. So here's some examples of working on the brickwork. When necessary, we actually insert fiberglass rods into the brickwork to support it so we don't have to replace the pieces of brick. And um, it's a, a major project, but it's made us truly appreciate um, Venetian building materials and how the Torcello community uh, modified their church. We're working on the mosaics. And here you can see the master mosaic restorer, Giovanni Cucco, who was also working on the mosaics in the late 70s. So he has his incredible knowledge of the artwork, his memory, and is now going back through every inch of the mosaics, uh, making sure that they are firmly attached to the wall. He listens to the sound. He can sort of hear the hollow sound and determines which, which areas need to be injected with, with resins to protect, uh, to keep the mosaic pieces attached to the wall. And the mosaic pieces are also cleaned uh, and, and this way, um, so that they'll be protected and in good shape for years. Here you can see injecting the resins into the mosaics in the areas where they start to detach, whether they're detaching from the initial plaster or if it's a deeper detachment from the wall behind it. And uh, Mr. Kuko marks the wall with the little stickers so he can see uh, where these areas, he's heard that there's a detachment and also checks back his records from the 70s to see uh, exactly 70s and 80s, to see how much the work that had been done some 40 years ago uh, is still in place. This is a wonderful mosaic of the angel Michael that has been conserved. And you can see there's the vast variety of colors and stones involved. We're learning a lot about the mosaics and the various renovations, restorations they went through. Here you have two um, figures of heads from the Diaconicon Chapel, and you see that the, the one figure on the, the left is, is a larger mosaic, a sort of a looser um, mortar, a, a looser design than the one on the right, which had, was, is much tighter. And the difference here is that the one on the right, the one with the, sort of the pink headgear, uh, is a mosaic from uh, the verge of the 10th of the 11th century while well, the other piece was reworked in the 19th century during a restoration where there were more replacement uh, sections added. And you can see the difference in the workmanship, but certainly we're preserving both uh, the newer mosaic and the older. The vault of uh, the Diaconicon Chapel is of particular interest. It's, we have these wonderful colors and um, animals of the apocalypse and the angels holding up the, um, the Lamb of God. We were particularly interested in this vault because um, of the structure of it and concerns that it may not be structurally sound. And we knew that we needed to be absolutely certain that the vault was stable before we would continue with more work on the mosaics. And so the project director, the architect in charge of the project decided that he needed to be up on the roof and open some, move some roof tiles, open a section of the roof so he and the workmen could look at the vault and make sure that it didn't have cracks or structural problems. When this was done, peeking down in the roof, we saw some color, which meant that there were frescoes in this area underneath the roof line, which led to a major project, unexpected. So we ended up opening up a large section of roof above the vault containing 11th century mosaics. 
removing all sorts of debris above the vault, and then uncovering frescoes. These frescoes were a major discovery that was announced in July of 2020, during the, when we just found them. Because this means that the church was very highly decorated before the 11th century the mosaics. So it sort of changes the whole idea about Venetian Byzantine style, because the Venetians, people from Torcello, uh, are already decorating in a Carolingian style, looking to the art of Charlemagne in Northern Europe. So it had originally been thought that the, the, the people of Torcello and Venice um, absorbed the Byzantine influence of art, and this is slowly seeming to be not completely the case. We have figures of the Virgin Mary, seems to be an Annunciation scene, and also of St. Martin. The St. Martin figure was important because this is what allowed us to date the frescoes to the ninth century, because experts who could read the writing in the form of the letters uh, confirmed that this was definitely a ninth century endeavor. So the fact that Torcello uh, was so widely decorated in, uh, in this area, which is high up under the roof line, unfortunately no longer seen because it was covered when the vault of the, the Byzantine mosaics were added. Um, but these, this discovery has created new interest in Torcello and that's something um, very exciting for say Venice to be involved in. It was a big press conference this last summer of 2020 when we announced the, the discovery. And now scholars have been further working to understand uh, Torcello in an earlier time period. Continuing our work in August, we actually found other fre uh, fresco fragments, this time down in the crypt, so not under the roof line. And now studies are underway to determine what to do. These had been plastered over and then filled in. They were behind an altar that had been added in the 16th century and so hadn't been on view for, for centuries. And uh, again, these aren't quite as intact, but we have the sense that the entire crypt area was completely covered with frescoes. So again, Torcello is full of frescoes and not just mosaics. Continuing with our work on the mosaics though and the frescoes, uh, we're working in the Sintraman area now where we'll be um, helping to restructure the brickwork and trying to determine if there are other frescoes behind some of the marble sheeting that you can see. The church was heavily restored in the 1930s. And this is one that other frescoes before thought to be from the 11th century or closer to the dating in the mosaics. Uh, but now we're reconsidering the dating of these frescoes. And once we take down the, the marble sheeting, which is necessary for conservation, we may have other discoveries, but we are concentrating on the mosaics. Just now working on the central apse. Uh, this work will continue uh, in through the summer of 2021, where we have the Madonna di Ghitria and 12 apostles. These mosaics, again, the dating is always a bit uncertain. Um, probably the Madonna is thought to be between the 11th and 12th century the, and the apostles possibly a bit earlier. The apostles, of course, are very, very um, unique, the way they're put together, and also the sort of interesting Torcello realism. As the, as the apostles all stand, sort of a carpeted area with, with flowers and plants. And these are the flowering plants that grow in the, in the, in the um, marshland right around Torcello as seen by the, the photograph that I took on my last visit to, to the island with the same type of plants. So it's interesting to think about these craftsmen, these master mosaic artists who probably came from the East, Byzantine artists, and were inspired by the local um, plant life and include that in their mosaics. So as time goes on, our scaffolding will be uh, raised even further and we'll be working on this vast, vast area of uh, gold mosaic and and also trying to determine again the structural stability of the vault behind the mosaic. The Madonna de Ghitria is maybe one of the, the one of the best known icons in Venice, a sort of a truly iconic figure um, of, of Mary, the sort of the, the queen of the sea as written in Latin beneath her. 
um, expressing um, salvation and blessing through the Christ child, blessing the Venetian lagoon community. Switching our gears back to Venice, uh, I'm going to say that say Venice is involved in many, many projects, uh, not just the major work at San Sebastiano, uh, working on understanding Veronese's work methods, or in Torcello, where we're actually protecting the bricks and um, Byzantine mosaics, but also many, many projects uh, within the city of Venice. Another important anniversary project for Say Venice, which is just beginning in October of uh, 2020, is the restoration of the Italian synagogue. The Venetian ghetto was established in 1516, and it was an area of the city where uh, the Jewish uh, community, Jewish merchants and bankers could live permanently. It, it was a system, an enclosure system, certainly uh, with many restrictions, but it did allow Jews from all over Europe to come and permanently settle in Venice. As seen through the various synagogues, there are five synagogues in the Venetian ghetto. Each synagogue um, founded by the nation that came to Venice. There's a German synagogue, there's a Spanish synagogue, Levantine synagogue, um, French synagogue. This is the Italian synagogue that say Venice has adopted. It was a synagogue that's not very well known because it hasn't been part of the, um, the museum of the ghetto of Venice's tour because of access problems. And so right now there's a very large project underway. It would say Venice is involved with the, the Jewish community and other funders to restore and renovate the museum of the ghetto and also the synagogues that are in the, um, this area of the ghetto vecchio and the ghetto nuovo. And so the Italian synagogue uh, will once again be a part of the, the tour of the museum and people will once again understand this Italian community that isn't very well known uh, within the ghetto. We're also working with another um, confraternity, so similar to the, the idea of, of, of the Jewish community of Venice. There's also the Dalmatian community. They weren't under the same restrictions of the Jewish community, but they had their own meeting house and their own um, artworks. We're restoring a cycle of paintings by Vittorio Carpaccio. And these uh, paintings tell the life of the saints that are important to this Dalmatian community. So uh, St. Augustine, uh, St. Matthew, and a series of, of stories in a very narration. We've already, we're sort of halfway through the project now, uh, and we will be continuing in the, many of these works maybe in Washington in the spring of 21 for the Carpaccio exhibition there. Of course, another major work that Zay Venice is involved with is the Assumption of the Virgin, which is Titian's great painting for the Church of Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari. This may be the largest panel painting uh, in the world, painted on wood, still in its original location in the Church of the Frari. So this is a massive endeavor that Zay Venice looks forward to uh, completing within the next year. So that basically um, gives you a sense of what it means to say Venice. Um, Venice is a city that's had to reinvent itself after plague, after war, economic strife, but then continued to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Saving Venice can mean saving the city from the water, but it also means promoting Venice's artistic patrimony. It could be restoring a great masterpiece like Titian's Assumption, could be understanding pigments that a painting like a painter as Veronese used. It's also remembering the traditions of the Venetian ghetto or Dalmatian community. Oh, and then it also means taking a new look at Venetian history through the discovery of frescoes on the island of Torcello. So all of these things um, help to keep Venice alive. Uh, it makes Venice a living city. And not just because of its residents, but because of the vitality of its artistic patrimony. Thank you. Um, I guess 
there are a few questions. And Sorry, uh, Melissa, this is Jan. I want to thank you for agreeing to take questions from our viewers. Um, the first question is from Eric Neal, director of the Chrysler Museum. How are the new floodgates working? Well, we had a very successful trial of them two weeks ago, and um, they went up and down without a problem and did protect the city from an estimated high tide. But we are expecting a big tide tomorrow, and it's not certain if the floodgates will be able to, to lift. Uh, so we're hopeful that in the future we won't have problems, but they're still working out some of the problems. Thank you. Um, another question from one of our viewers, how does Save Venice determine which artworks they will conserve? We have a board of directors that uh, meets in Venice once a year, twice a year in New York, and uh, we review the projects that usually I put together during the year, and um, then our projects committee of experts sort of vets the projects that we proposed, and then the board votes depending on the urgency uh, also the importance of the impact on the Venetian patrimony. Um, another question from our viewer, how far out beyond the island of Venice are you planning on extending your conservation projects? We work in Venice proper and all through the Venetian lagoon. So Torcello, which is out about 40 minutes away from Venice, but still considered part of the Venetian territory and also the other islands in the lagoon but we um, rarely extend beyond Venice. Uh, what are the biggest problems facing your organization? Right now, it's difficult to remain connected with our supporters and our donors because they often come to Venice uh, to see the artworks and uh, participate in fundraising events in Venice. And so we're having to adapt, as everyone is, to a new way of presenting our work. Along with that previous question, how has COVID impacted Say Venice as far as fundraising and conservation efforts? Well, all of our conservation projects uh, stopped in mid beginning of March when Italy went on a very strict lockdown and uh, they were allowed to reopen the beginning of May. And we felt it was very important then in May to keep working uh, as, as quickly as possible, also to support the conservators who had were risking sort of an economic uh, difficulties because of the work sites being closed. Uh, um, also for fundraising, we haven't been able to have the usual fundraising events. And so everybody is just exploring new ways to connect. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Alex Mann, a former curator at the Chrysler Museum. And he would like to know, in the 19th century, publicity materials from Venetian glassmakers argued that glass mosaics are significantly more durable than painted frescoes and thus a better choice for interior decoration projects. Is this true? Having worked with restoration of both painted interiors and mosaics, does one hold up better than the other? I would say yes, mosaics do hold up better uh, because frescoes are difficult in Venice because of the climate, because it's so terribly damp and humid and such a high salt content in the air. Whereas mosaics, um, yes, usually have a, a, are more resistant. We do have problems with the supporting walls, but all in all, I think that's a very accurate statement. A follow-on question to that from one of our viewers. What, make, what materials are the mosaics made of? They are, some of the pieces are glass and some of the pieces are stone. There's uh, precious marbles and different colored stones. And then the glass pieces have a, a sort of an inlay, a glaze on them. And also some of them have gold leaf. Um, another question from one of our viewers. The seawalls are good news, but what about the negative impact the volume of huge cruise ships uh, in the lagoon have? Cruise ships are a problem that not only Venice faces. It's certainly a, an issue in many, many cities all over the world. And it's something that is the, the port entries are determined by the, the national government, not the local city. So there have been movements uh, to try to limit their access. And that's still something being worked out with the Port Authorities of Venice and the national government. Um, what made you decide on St. Mark and Throne for the Titian restoration? 
it's a it's a painting that I've always loved. It's a very early Titian, painted when he was probably about 20 years old, uh, sometime between 1508 and 1510. The date is disputed. And it's a very important Venetian painting because it shows St. Mark, who's the patron saint of Venice, and then and other saints that are related to, that you pray to for relief of the plague or, or health reason. So it just was a painting that was always been meaningful to me. Uh, what has your greatest success been? Uh, as far as an organization for St. Venice, I think that the response we had after the high water of November of 2019, where we immediately sprang into action and raised funds to help uh, the city when it was most in, in need. And I think that it really stands well for our board being able to be very nimble and uh, to get our donors involved immediately and, and to support these these this traumatic time. All right, for our last question, what advice would you give the Chrysler since it is in a flood plain? And first of all, I suppose it's already the conservatives, the Chrysler would certainly have a protocol for removing artworks as quickly as possible. And also we found in Venice that if you maintain your ground floor areas as best, you know, keep them really up to date, then they do hold up better when there are flooding situations. And maybe consider sort of in the Venetian style of not using the ground floors, but having everything up on a, on a second floor area. Thank you. Uh, thank you for agreeing to take our questions today. And Melissa has agreed to keep the link for this lecture on our website for the remainder of our lecture series. Please feel free to share the link with your family and friends or revisit the lecture. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you to our speaker, Melissa Kahn. For more information regarding Save Venice, please go to savevenice.org. Our November 18th speaker will be Mark Skorka, President and CEO of Opera America. We are delighted to announce that this lecture will be a collaboration with Virginia Opera. Please note the earlier date due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Remember, you can always find information on our speakers and upcoming lectures on our NSA website, Instagram, and Facebook page. Thank you. I think we came in too. Oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> That was wonderful.